The following program is a broadcast production of the Civil War Broadcasting Network. It's available on the free YouTube channel, General Grant by himself, by Dr. E.C. Fields, on the Facebook page, Kurt Fields as General Ulysses S. Grant, the YouTube channels, Dr. E.C. Fields and General Grant by himself. Permission to copy and distribute is given and indeed encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, as part of the ongoing series, General Grant looks at the American Civil War, General Grant, and the taking of Fort Donelson. I am Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant, and I am in camp near Fort Donaldson. The surrender has been effected. It is now the 18th of February, 1862, and there is much to tell. On the 6th of February, after Fort Henry fell, I sent Major General Henry Halleck, my supervising general, a telegram which said, in part, I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th, returning to Fort Henry with the forces employed, unless it looks feasible to occupy that place with a small force that could retreat easily to the main body. I shall regard it more in the light of an advanced grand guard than as a permanent post. Owing to the intolerable state of the roads, no transportation will be taken to Fort Donelson, and but literal or little artillery, and that with double teams. Hoping that what has been done will meet the approval of the general commanding the department, I remain your obedient servant, General Ulysses. S. Grant. That may have been a little optimistic. It is very cold here in Fort Donaldson. When I told him that I would take Fort uh, Henry, or rather Fort Donaldson, on the 8th, I did not take into account getting the troops together, nor the heavy rain and the Tennessee River rising and flooding for the first couple of days after Henry fell, it was all we could do to keep our goods and, and materials from being flooded and getting them to higher ground. It was on the 11th that I was able to begin the move for the about 12 miles from Henry on the Tennessee River to Donaldson on the Cumberland River. <clears throat> and there are two roads. There's the Telegraph Road and the Ridge Road. McClernand moved out first, uh, and taking both roads, and then General Smith moved after he did. We got to the fort uh, uh, early on the morning to mid-morning on the 12th, McClernand did, and began to invest or wanted to invest the right of the fort, uh, the rebel left. But he ran into uh, a fellow, a lieutenant colonel of cavalry, a fellow named uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, very ostentatious name, but uh, lieutenant colonel. And lieutenant colonel Forrest had dismounted his cavalry. He'd been placed in charge of all the cavalry at Fort Donaldson. But he put out his skirmishers, a strong skirmish line uh, in force, and was waiting for the Yankee troops to get there. McClernand got there and Forrest began to engage him. When he saw how many McClernand had, uh, he fell back toward the outer works of the fort. We began moving with about 15,000 men. The Navy was coming down uh, from Cairo with a flotilla of some 6,000 more troops, Indiana, Nebraska troops, in fact, and some other Midwestern states. I anticipated my numbers to increase greatly, but I thought that the 
Confederates may have as many as 50,000 men inside that fort. I certainly thought that they should have that many men, as critical as Fort Donaldson was to their defense, but I didn't know how many were there. I knew that there were a lot of them. But we began to develop them on the, uh, the 12th. Uh, Commander Walk, I believe it was, uh, took the Carondelet uh, ironclad up the river and engaged the forts, just probing them to develop what their defenses were and uh, fired a few rounds and they returned fire for a few rounds. It uh, was a day of us getting involved and uh, enveloping the fort. There was uh, some substantial uh, skirmishing and fighting. Our casualties were about 130, I think, for the day, and we pushed them back into the fort. Now, I had strict orders, do not bring on an engagement until all of our forces were gathered. Indeed, I wanted to see if Commander or Lieutenant uh, uh, Flag Officer Foote could take Donaldson like he did Fort Henry, and he was uh, not optimistic about that, but, and was really felt, uh, he felt he was not prepared, but I pressed him, <clears throat> and he uh, agreeably uh, went ahead and uh, was agreed to come and, and go after the fort. Uh, there were a couple of his gunboats that were beyond re, uh, service and had to go back to Cape Row for repair, so he had to swap a couple of uh, crews and so forth but I'm waiting on him, and again, I said, don't bring on an engagement. And as McClernand is getting into place, there were some rebel batteries there. One of them was a Maney's battery, and he was in front of McClernand, and he fired on McClernand several times. McClernand uh, opened fire back on him, a, a defensive measure, he told me. And uh, when he limbered up again, he moved Maney's battery, opened fire again, and it, this happened uh, several times. And finally, McClernand lost his temper and said, I'm going to uh, stop this. He sent four regiments after that, uh, that battery, Maney's battery, and uh, the rebels thought as much of that battery as McClernand did, and there became a pretty sharp fight. A number of casualties killed and wounded, and we very nearly were pulled into a battle. They didn't want one either, but there was plenty of fight in them, and McClernand almost got us into a fight before I was prepared to get into the fight. But that was on uh, the, the uh, 12th and into the 13th. We were fully in place by the 13th, and by, the, by this time, going into the uh, late into the 13th, into the 14th, I've got about 25,000 soldiers surrounding Donaldson, and uh, I have found out since the surrender that they had about 17,000, far less than I thought they did, far less than I thought they should have had to defend such a, an emplacement. But on uh, the afternoon of the, four, or, well, the evening of the 13th, the spring-like temperatures went away. The men had been given the, the, the great coats, as I have mine, and blankets, and uh, they packed them up when they began the march. They were ordered to take them off, leave them behind, and they marched without, or, and some of them discarded their uh, coats and blankets on the road, neatly packing them. Nobody threw their coats on the side of the road. That's something that's being bandied about. It's not true. But uh, they thought that this was spring or February in Tennessee. Uh, sometimes it is, and as we found out, sometimes it's not. But at the, uh, uh, on the 13th, going into the 14th, the spring-like temperatures went away and a heavy rain set in, and then it began to snow and freeze. And men were absolutely miserable. They began to uh, rue having left their coats and blankets behind. And uh, we had a number of uh, frostbite cases, ears, toes, fingers, uh, very hard to work your guns. And we were so close to the rebel lines that we could not have fires. So the men had to sleep on their arms in the snow 
and ice, and the temperatures drop to, I understand, about some 10 or 12 degrees below zero, and uh, the killed and wounded, when the uh, uh, aides came through to pick up the, the wounded and the, and the dead, uh, those that had long hair was frozen to the ground, and it had to be cut with scissors before the men could be picked up. Bitterly cold, bitterly cold on the 13th and into the 14th. Uh, on the afternoon of the 14th, uh, Flag Officer Foote brought his flotilla. He had seven or six boats. Now, his ironclads that he bought were the St. Louis, his flagship. He had the Louisville, the Pittsburgh, and the Carondelet, the city class. Those are all cities. And uh, had two timber clads, and they were the Tyler and the Conestoga. They held back behind the line of the four ironclads of, uh, who came abreast, and the channels narrow, so they could not fan out four abreast. They had to get through a narrow channel and then fan out. And when they did, they were only able to bring 12 guns. The four uh, boats had three bow guns against more than 20 uh, guns in uh, Fort Donaldson, the upper and lower water batteries. And ab about 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, foot, flag officer foot approached and engaged the batteries, hoping it would be another Fort Henry. I placed myself in a a good position to watch the battle, and it lasted about 90 minutes. And the uh, the Donaldson batteries really pounded the, the flotilla. Uh, his flagship, the St. Louis, the flag officer Foote's flagship, the St. Louis, had the pilot house carried away in the steering wheel. Foot was wounded in the shoulder, and the foot, his pilot, was killed. And uh, the ropes, the backup ropes, tackles could not uh, bring the rudder about, and the same thing happened to the Louisville. They were badly damaged and lost their steering. In fact, they were bumping against each other in the river and floating back downstream. Uh, 54 men were killed and wounded. Uh, it, it was uh, a hard day for the, uh, the Navy there on the Cumberland River. When they fell back in, late in the afternoon, going into the early evening, I had resolved that we were going to have to move into a siege position and I began to tighten the lines as best I could around the fort. Late in the evening, early morning of the 15th of February, uh, Flag Officer Foote sent a messenger to me. I was about five miles away uh, from him uh, at the Widow Crisp house, uh, which is interesting because the widow Crisp is not really a widow. Her husband didn't die. Uh, I understand about a year ago, uh, as, it, as I was told, her old man uh, told her he was going into town and he never came back. He, I expect he kept on going. And out of sensitivity to, to Mrs. Crisp, uh, people just refer to her uh, as the widow Crisp. And I was in her house, her cabin, and had established my headquarters. And Flag Officer Foote sent a note to me, could I come to meet him on his flagship there at the St. Louis and uh, talk with him. And I was very concerned he was going to tell me that he was pulling out. And I left to go meet with him. But I left standing orders with McClernand and with General Smith, C.F. Smith, and with General Lou Wallace, who is involved now as well, uh, he's plugging the line between McClernand on the right and Smith on the left. Wallace is in there, and there's still about a half a mile between his lines and McClernand's lines, and he's very, as he should be, concerned about that. But I left firm directives. Do not bring on an engagement. Uh, and I, I realize now that I erred in not leaving anybody in command to make a decision it did not occur to me that the rebels might try to break out, which they did. But uh, the I went to meet with Flag Officer Foote on the St. Louis. Now, what had happened in the background is on the morning of the 13th, John Floyd arrived and took command of Fort Donaldson. And he advised uh, Gideon Pillow, who is now junior to him, and Simon Buckner, who is the most junior man, 
that uh, they were only to delay at Fort Donaldson to buy as much time for Sidney Johnston as possible, he was going to evacuate Bowling Green, Kentucky, north east of us at, here at Donaldson, and they were to buy time. So even before we had a fight with them, the Confederates had decided to vacate Fort Donaldson, which I think was a mistake, a serious mistake on their part. And I think the worst mistake that Sidney Johnston made was that he did not come to Fort Donaldson and take command himself. It, even if he had been captured, the loss would have been no worse than what it was as it has turned out to be. Uh, I'm very surprised that Johnston did not come himself and take command. He had Floyd, who has no military experience, commanding Gideon Pillow, who has the most miserable kind of military experience. I, I remember him from the Mexican War uh, and uh, supervising uh, under him uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner, who is a good man, a professional soldier, and a foe to be wary of, and it would have been uh, a, a different approach to the fort if Buckner had been in command. In fact, he told me uh, after the surrender when we were chatting, uh, he said if uh, I had been in command, it, it would have been a different matter. And I told him if I had known you were in command, I should have approached the entire matter differently. But, but, but Floyd got there the morning of the 13th, and it, it already inside the fort, unbeknownst to me, the, the attitude is changed, the mentality is changing. And uh, of course, the, the heavy rain, the snow, and the ice falls and forms on the enemy just as much as it does on us. And they were suffering terribly. The men were suffering terribly in both armies. And nobody could have a fire to warm themselves because we were so close. But I went to see Flag Officer Foote, and he told me that he was, his fleet was so badly beaten, two ships were totally out of commission, two boats, two more boats were badly banged and beat up, and he wanted to go back to Cairo and refit, and he would come back as soon as, as possible. And I asked him, I pleaded with him, could you at least keep one boat and perhaps around the bend there is a long river the Cumberland goes a long stretch in front of Fort Donaldson and then curves around to the right as you are looking from, from the batteries and all I asked him to do for that boat would be to keep steam up and those plumes of heavy smoke would be coming up and the rebels would think that we would uh, would be coming back at any time, and he agreed to do that. We met for uh, a good little while, and that's when I got the cigar, and I think it may lead to something of a legend. It already is, apparently. Uh, I should tell you that Flag Officer Foote is an absolute teetotaler, very uh, against drinking. In fact, he's done away with the grog <coughs> ration, on his boats. Uh, sailors get twice a day, they get a few drams of grog. Well, Flag Officer Foot stopped that. He also preaches to his uh, sailors every Sunday, and they're all required to attend. And I told him that you're the only preacher I know, uh, except the chaplains at the academy. When I was going there, we were required to attend services and march there in company. Uh, but he's the only uh, Navy officer I know, preacher I know, that has a 100% attendance in his congregation every Sunday. But he likes his cigars, and he preferred me a cigar, which you know, I prefer a pipe, but uh, being polite, I took his cigar and was having a smoke, and we brought our meeting to an end, and this is mid-morning. And when I stepped out of the meeting, W.S. Hillier, William Hillier, a lawyer that I from St. Louis that I had worked with when I was a real estate agent uh, in a law firm he was a part of is white faced and met me and said the rebels have broken out there's a savage battle going on and it does not look good for us well I was on old Jack my rocking horse and we 
uh, uh, hurried back to the battlefield, as I said, some five miles. But it's been, remember, it's freezing, ground's covered with ice, and what's not iced over is uh, mud. So it took us quite a while to get back to the battlefield. The rebels had broken out at about six or a little afterward. The plan was to push us away from the, the entrenchments of the outer fort and up against the river and to leave the river road open. And then Pillow and Buckner, uh, Pillow and Floyd, after Buckner's men had come out on our right, they had come out and opened the road, then the Confederates had marked out the river road and escaped. And they, as it turns out, they easily could have. But because of some real confusion in the Confederate command between Floyd and Pillow, Buckner was doing his job and doing it well. Uh, his men were acting with great credit to themselves and their commander. But Pillow called them all back. Now, they had pushed McClernand a long way back, substantial way back, cleared the way, and Pillow tells them all to come back. And they and, and uh, Floyd rides his horse to Buckner and demands, what are you doing? And Buckner, of course, realizes what a foolhardy move it was, fatal for them, and he said, I'm only following my orders to pull back. Get them changed. So... Floyd rides to Pillow and says, my God, General, what are you doing? And he said, we've accomplished our purpose. We pushed the Federals back. I've called my men back in. And they went back in. They threw away a victory. When I got to uh, Buckner, or Wallace and McClernand, I noted Wallace was there. And General Wallace may well have saved the day because when McClernand was hit, he sent men uh, messengers, three different messengers, I understand, to my staff and said, I'm being attacked, send me help, and they ignored him. Uh, it may well be because he, they, they feel it to be such a blowhard, they didn't pay any attention that he was crying wolf. I know not at this time, but he was asking for help, and my staff was ignoring him. Finally, he sent a runner to Wallace and said, I need help. Wallace understands that there's don't bring on an engagement, but he sees what is happening. And he segued his men to his right and engaged the Confederates and uh, did a, a masterful job of the defense. And he and McClernand were able to rally and stop the backward movement. And again, I had left no orders uh, or left no one in charge, just don't bring on a fight, not taking into account what if they bring the fight to us. It was a lesson well learned, hard learned. But when I got to uh, McClernand and Wallace, I was pleased to see Wallace, and the first thing that McClernand said to me, he snarled at me, this army wants a general. And I crushed that piece of paper in my hand. Hillier says that's the only emotion I showed, and it was. Uh, and I said, I expect it does. General, that ground must be retaken. I noticed that men were milling around, just milling around. And they were, they were out of ammunition. There were boxes, crates and crates of ammunition lying everywhere. They just didn't have any leaders to tell them, put 40 rounds in your uh, pouch, a cartridge box, and let's move. And I told my uh, chief of staff, Webster, Tell these men to put 40 rounds, get them in ranks, and tell them we must retake that ground. Another problem was that we had lost a, a, a heavily disproportionate number of officers, particularly field officers. So they, the men had no leadership, and they're all, for the most part, green troops. But Webster got them together, began organizing them, told them, get, there are the boxes, get the cartridges, fill your pouches, and let's get in line. And they began to move. They, all they wanted was uh, some leadership. Now, there are McClernand and, and Wallace sitting their horses there in the, in the midst of them and not giving those simple directions. And he's snarling at me, we need a leader. Then I, I went to, I said, that, gentlemen, that ground must be retaken. Then I turned my horse and rode to uh, General Smith on my left, the rebel right. 
And uh, I told my staff that have gathered by now, don't ride fast. Don't make the or let the rebels think we're panicky. Ride your horses at a moderate rate, which we did. I found General Smith sitting down waiting for orders, and I said, General, that you must take Fort Donaldson. And he unfolded like a carpenter's slide rule, a very tall, spare man, and he said, I'll do it. And he did. He advanced and took those works because I was being told that with their knapsacks full, the, the dead and wounded and the prisoners, Confederates, that they, my men were interpreting it, they were going to fight us until we gave out. I realized, no, that's not their mission. They're escaping. They're taking everything with them. And if they're strong here on our right, they're going to be weak on our left. And that's where I told General Smith to go in, and he did so successfully. We pushed them back. We retook the ground, and they'd been fighting all day. The fighting stopped only with darkness. Heavy wounded, heavy casualties, no less than, than 1,200. And of those, 250 were captured, and I've got to keep 250 Confederate prisoners to exchange for the 250 federal prisoners because they'd been sent out so fast to uh, prison camps that we, we've got to keep men and exchange them later. And we felt our men went to sleep on their arms uh, at the night of the 15th, after the breakout had been contained and pushed back, that we would prevail the next day. Floyd and Buckner and Pillow are having a rather frantic conference, and Pillow and uh, Floyd decide to leave. Floyd says, I can't be captured. And indeed, he thought, well, I think with good reason, he'd been former Secretary of War, uh, that he'd be hanged for treason. He said, well, I've got to get out of here. Of course, I think his, I think his backbone failed him too. He wants to be a general. He should have acted like one and surrendered with his men. And uh, he turned the command over to Pillow, who immediately uh, said, well, I can't be captured either. His backbone, too, failed him. And he turned and gave it to Buckner, and Buckner accepted and said, I will surrender the fate of my men. Pillow and Buckner went to the river, and there aren't any boats available until about daylight, daybreak. And uh, here comes a boat full of uh, Confederate soldiers' reinforcements. Floyd unloaded them and loaded his Virginia soldiers on the boat and skedaddled. And he left the new men coming in who have no idea what's happening to be captured. Pillow was able to get across. He couldn't get across with Floyd. Floyd muscled him out of the way, so to speak. Pillow got a flat boat and pulled his way, I understand, across the river to escape. Not a courageous performance on the part of either Floyd or Pillow. Buckner, though, realized that he would have to surrender. But this Colonel Forrest, I understand, uh, had a, quite a few things. He heated the air uh, in that meeting, and he said, but essentially, these, the mothers of these soldiers, my boys, entrusted them to me to take care of them. And surrendering them is not, in my view, taking care of them. And I didn't come here to surrender. I'm going to escape. And he went down Lick Creek, I believe it was. He said, there's a way out of here. It's obvious. And there was. At that time, we weren't guarding Lick Creek. We found this out after the fact. So Forrest took, he said, I'll take my cavalry, about 500 men, I understand. And whoever wants to come with me, and I, I think about 200 Confederate soldiers escaped with him, and the water was up to the blankets on the horses. They're up almost to the saddles, freezing water. The men suffered, and, and the horses too, but the men who had to walk suffered that exposure. But Colonel Forrest escaped with about 700 men. He started, I understand, to send word back to, Pilla, uh, to uh, Buckner, come, this way is open but the sky was getting pretty light in the east. 
and he knew there was no time. It was over for Buckner. But Buckner sent me a note early in the early hours, and he sent me this note. In consideration of all the circumstances governing the present situation of affairs at this station, I propose to the commanding officers of the Federal Forces the appointment of commissioners to agree upon terms of capitulation of the forces under my command, and in that view suggest an armistice until 12 o'clock today. I am very respectfully your obedient servant. Fort Donaldson, February the 16th, 1862. Well, C.F. Smith intercepted the messenger and brought that message to me and I read it and I said, well, General, what do you think about that? And he said, bah, no terms to the damned rebels except unconditional surrender. And I said, I thought about that and I said, that sounds good, bring me pencil and paper. And I wrote this note. Years of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation is just received. No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. I am, sir, very respectfully your obedient servant, U.S. Grant to General S.B. Buckner, Confederate Army. And I sent that right to him. Well, shortly, white flags begin to go up on the Confederate lines, and I received this message. The distribution of forces under my command incident to an unexpected change of commanders, and the overwhelming force under your command compelled me notwithstanding the brilliant success of the Confederate arms yesterday, to accept the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms you propose. I am, sir, your very obedient servant, S.B. Buckner, Brigadier General U.S. Grant. So I then went to meet with General Buckner, and I was a little surprised when I got to the Dover Hotel and I walked in and I met General Buckner to be sure, but sitting there having breakfast with General Buckner was General Lew Wallace, the most junior officer, I believe, in my command. Now, General Wallace is a political appointee. He's a good man and has displayed courage on the field, exposing himself with uh, no concern for his well-being. But he's not schooled in the uh, niceties and the protocol of the Army. He should not have gone in to meet and to take, I think he meant to take the surrender of General Buckner. He should have waited outside until the commanding general arrived. but. I said nothing to him and uh, took no further note of it. I believe somebody may have said something to him. But we took the surrender. Uh, some uh, 17,000 men, I believe at the time, I think about 13,000 ultimately were put on the boats to be taken to prison camps. Now, this was the first time an entire army had been taken in surrender. and. Uh, I, we took uh, 40, 45 pieces of artillery, uh, many stands of arms, thousands upon thousands of men. It was the largest army that had ever, largest number of troops ever taken prisoner on this continent. And I, I was very pleased with that. Uh, and we didn't put up armed guards around the prisoners. We trusted the prisoners to do as they, what they should do. Well, uh, many of them felt what they should do was to walk up into the woods overnight in the darkness, and many did. 
uh, another lesson learned for us in taking the captives. In fact, uh, another general, there was a fourth general there, Bushrod Johnson. There was Floyd, Pillow, Buckner, and Bushrod Johnson. And uh, Bushrod just walked off into the night to live to fight another day. And uh, something else that happened was the cigar. Remember I told you Flag Officer Foote gave me a cigar. Well, I kept the cigar all day. And like now, it went out. Every once in a while, I might relight it. But some newspaper reporter saw me with the cigar and sketched me and sent back to his paper, I think the Chicago Tribune, but a Chicago paper with a sketch of me and a cigar with the caption, the great Victor Grant smokes a cigar. And I'm already beginning to get cigars. I prefer a pipe, but I'm getting so many cigars that I, I'm smoking the cigars and I don't know, the men are, are teasing me about my cigars, my staff is anyway. So Donaldson is taken, Floyd and Pillow escaped, Buckner is going to a prison camp with his men. I offered him my purse, he helped me out with the financial problem back at the Astor House in New York City in 54, and I wanted to return the favor, I offered him my purse and he politely declined, and uh, we parted on as good a terms as possible considering the situation. That night, the 16th, I wrote Julia a letter, and I said, Dear wife, I am most happy to write you from this very strongly fortified place now in my possession, after the greatest victory of the season. Some 12 or 15,000 prisoners have fallen into our possession to say nothing of five to seven thousand that escaped in the darkness of the night last night. This is the largest capture I believe ever made on the continent. You warned me against Captain Coombs. He can do me no harm. He is known as a venomous man whose hand is raised against every man is without friends or influence. That was a supply quartermaster problem I had. My impression is that I shall have one hard battle more to fight and will find easy sailing after that. No telling, though, this was one of the most desperate affairs fought during this war. Our men were out three terrible cold nights and fighting through the day without tents. Captain Hillier would explain all to you. I sent William Hillier back to St. Louis, kiss the children for me. I will write my next letter to Covington, Covington, Kentucky, where my parents were living, Eulis. The report that I sent to my immediate superior officer, uh, Brigadier General uh, G.W. Cullum, uh, reported that and uh, told him of the, the victory and what had happened and he was very praising. General Halleck was not praising, uh, said nothing, but uh, Brigadier General, uh, Adjutant General Cullum was very praising. On the 17th, I found out through telegram that President Lincoln had promoted me to Major General of Volunteers. Uh, he got the word, uh, I understand, close to midnight on the 16th and uh, Secretary of War Stanton advised him 